Hello everyone. Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Indian Chess Society. I am Dr. Rajesh Swarnakar, Secretary of the ICS. In our effort to bring evidence-based knowledge on various aspects concerning practice of a pulmonologist, we bring to you an educational series on non-invasive ventilation, which is being increasingly used in our country now. The inaugural webinar of this five-part series happened on 4th of August, which covered basic physiology and concepts as applied to non-invasive ventilation. In the second edition of webinar series on essentials of non-invasive ventilation, the online course, today we will be discussing NIV usage in acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, which is the most common and robust indication of NIV usage. The objective of essential of non-invasive ventilation course is to provide participants with an overview of the current evidence-based clinical knowledge and entry-level technical skills to deliver NIV safely and effectively in the clinical settings, which is being done by a simplified case-based pedagogy. I would strongly encourage you to attend all the five webinars in the series and complete the assessments at the end of each session to earn a certification from Indian Chess Society. These webinars will also be available online as archived link on our ICS website later and can be assessed freely at your leisure time. I would like to thank ResMed India as industry partner for, the, for coming forward to collaborate with the ICS for this course which is being made available to you now. In today's webinar, uh, we welcome Dr. Sujit Rajan, Consultant, Respiratory Medicine Department of Pulmonology, Bombay Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai, as a moderator. Welcome to you, Dr. Sujit. We are also pleased to have our well-known Dr. Raja Dhar, who is Director of Department of Pulmonology, Fortis Hospital, Kolkata. He would be speaking on NIV in acute hypercapnic failure, followed by a case discussion on this topic by me. Uh, we will end the webinar, but not before a short panel discussion and a brief question answer session. So please post us questions, but of course restricting them to only today's topic of NIV in acute hypercapnic failure, because of course subsequent topics will be taken in the upcoming webinars. With this brief introduction, I invite Dr. Rajadha to open today's session by delivering his talk on his topic of NIV in acute hypercapnic failure. Over to you, Dr. Raja. Thank you. Hello, friends. I'm here today to talk to you about a problem that you face often in your clinical practice. It's the use of non-invasive ventilation in acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. You've heard the lecture on respiratory physiology the last day we spoke. But just to reiterate things and refresh your memory, think of this as being two different boxes. There's the lung box, which is at the level of the alveoli and the interstitium. And here, a problem in the alveoli, as in an alveolar filling disease, or an interstitial process like an ILD results in what might be termed as lung failure or a pulmonary failure, which results in a reduction of exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, resulting in the hypoxic respiratory failure with a reduction of the PO2 and the PaCO2. Compare this with the respiratory pump failure. And when we talk, talk about pump failure, we think of it in the ambit of the breathing tubes, the respiratory muscles, including the diaphragm, and the chest wall muscles, the ribs, and so on. So the musculoskeletal system. So this is more of ventilatory failure, 
rather than the pulmonary failure that we spoke about a little while ago. And because it's pump failure, it results in hypoxia. So it results in a reduction of PaO2. However, this results in an increase in PaCO2 and hence the hypercapnic respiratory failure, which is the topic of discussion for today. For my convenience, I would quote the BTS guidelines from 2016 when we try and classify the different categories of NIV in acute hypercapnic failure. So here, there are three different causes. The most important one, which is probably 70% of this entire box, is COPD. The second one is obesity, and obesity can be an overlap with COPD or without an overlap, and we'll come back to this later on. And the last bit, which I'll touch only briefly on, is neuromuscular diseases. We'll go into this with, in greater detail, but I want you to remember this. So when we talk about COPD and an acute hypercapnic failure in the context of this, the patient has to be acidotic, so a pH of less than 7.35. The patient has to be hypercapnic, that's 6.5 kilopascals. And because this is BTS, we'll do kilopascals rather than millimeters of mercury. But just for you to remember, the factor for conversion would be 7.5. So this entails about 48.75, make it a round figure of 50. So PCO2 of more than 50 or even 45 is what we are referring to when we define acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. And the patient has to be tachypnic. When you look at obesity, you can see that with obesity, the parameters of respiratory acidosis remain the same. The definition of tachypnea remains the same. However, there's an alternative. So if you have a daytime awake PaCO2 of more than six and the patient is somnolent, that can find and fall under the broad umbrella of obesity hyperventilation syndrome. And then you get to neuromuscular disease. And here, with neuromuscular disease, because it's a disease which affects the chest wall muscles, the intercostals, the ribs, etc., the diaphragm, etc. Here, there's a vital capacity of VC which comes in. So if you have someone who has an acute respiratory illness with tachypnea, defined here as a respiratory rate of more than 20, and if the vital capacity is less than a liter, even if the PaCO2 is less than 6.5, like we spoke about in the obesity compartment, or like the other compartments, if the pH is less than 7.35 and PaCO2 is more than 6.5, this is acute hypercapnic failure as a result of neuromuscular disease. So the numbers, if you can see, broadly remain the same. Obesity, TOPD, neuromuscular disease, there has to be acidosis with a pH of less than 7.35 and a PaCO2 of more than 6.5. And then individual categories based on obesity and neuromuscular disease have a separate category, a separate definition, which I would want all of you to remember from this particular slide. This is a slide which is age old now. It's more than 10 years old, but I think it's worth repeating. So you can see that there is the neural drive from the top, from the sensory cortex, the motor cortex. There's the brain stem, and then there's the neural respiratory drive. And based on this, you are going to have two different defects. You can have a reduced capacity of the respiratory muscles, or you can have an increased load on the respiratory muscles. In the category of reduced capacity of respiratory muscles, you will have various causes. So the hyperinflation resulting in diaphragmatic flatting and stretching of the diaphragm, the systemic involvement, which is triggered both by the stretching of the diaphragm and the overload of inflammation from the lung into the systemic circulation, the so systemic inflammation. You remember COPD is a systemic disease rather than an airways disease. There's the steroids, there's various comorbidities which trigger, trigger inflammation, and all of this together reduce capacity of respiratory muscles. On the other side, you've got the load on the respiratory muscles being increased. Here again, you have dynamic hyperinflation with the production of intrinsic PEEP, you have airways obstruction, which leads to this. There's the shortened period of inspiration, there's thoracic stretching, and there's increased ventilatory demand from the fallouts of COPD, 
for the lung failure, the respiratory failure, if there's uh, concomitant anemia, if there's concomitant heart failure, all of this together will result in an increased load of the respiratory muscles. Before coming into the concept of NIV, which all of you are familiar with, I'm sure, let's try and think why non-invasive ventilation is probably the most evidence-based modality today in the management of acute hyperapnic respiratory failure. And you can see the results from between the late 1980s to the late 1990s with invasive mechanical ventilation. And if you look at various studies of varying sizes, the commonality is a mortality of somewhere between 30 to 50 percent. So all patients with acute hypercapnic ventilatory failure, respiratory failure, who went on to invasive mechanical ventilation, one out of three to one out of two, depending on which study you looked at, would die on invasive mechanical ventilation. And hence this concept of non-invasive ventilation, which we are speaking to you about and will speak to you about through this entire module, came into being. What's the rationale? And these are common sense factors, but still worth reiterating. And you will probably hear this as monotone throughout this particular module. So when we talk about improvement of respiratory parameters, we talk about improvement of VQ mismatch, as is evidenced by the blood gases, the respiratory rate, and the subjective sense of dyspnea in the patient comes down, the diaphragm functions better, and then improvement of symptoms. We have talked about dyspnea. There's improvement in communication and the improvement in swallowing because the general function of the muscles improve with the rest that these muscles get on non-invasive ventilation. And clearance of secretions become easier when you take the IV mask off and get these patients to cough. Clearance of secretion becomes much easier. So those were the effects on symptoms. Let's look at the effects that it has in the way of intubation and avoiding it and related complications. So you saw the mortality associated with invasive ventilation, the related complications of invasive ventilation, which you are all familiar with, the infection, which is the VAP, the late complication, which is related to the tube, the complication related to having a catheter in, which is almost compulsory in almost all patients on invasive mechanical ventilation, and with the ones who are difficult to wean, a tracheostomy and the complications which come with the tracheostomy are all important. And then to improve outcome, that's the easy bit. It's difficult to achieve, but easy to understand is what I mean. So reducing the length of ICU and hospital stay and reduction of mortality, all of this come as an umbrella under the non-invasive ventilation uh, gamut. So we talked about infections. It's not just VAP. It's not just nosocomial pneumonias, but it's also urinary tract infections, catheter-related infections, which are far lower, as you see from this JAMA study from 20 years ago, in the non-invasive ventilation arm as compared to the conventional mechanical ventilation arm. When do we start non-invasive ventilation in acute hypercapnic failure? The NIV should be started when the patient is acidotic, and it has to be respiratory acidosis. So the two numbers to go by is a pH of less than 7.35 and a PCO2 of above 50. And this should be persistent despite optimal medical therapy. And it's not really within the ambit of this talk to talk about optimal medical therapy, but I guess you guys know this anyway. And this is grade A evidence. So very, very evidence-based. There's lots of rationale and logic behind this BTS guideline. Severe acidosis, however, does not say that you cannot use non-invasive ventilation. This is a concept from about 20 years ago that if your pH is less than 7.2, it stayed for invasive mechanical ventilation. Two, that invasive mechanical ventilation is something which should be considered. However, if there is no other contraindication, giving a trial of non-invasive ventilation, even in this scenario, with severe respiratory acidosis has a grade B evidence, and you can actually prevent a few invasive mechanical ventilation by using this particular approach. What's the level of evidence with various indications for NIV? So several RCTs and high level of evidence is with the COPD exacerbation, with acute cardiogenic respiratory failure in patients who are being weaned post-extubation as a result of COPD. 
So COPD exacerbation, heart failure, and weaning post extubation in COPD have the strongest base of evidence. And then in medium evidence, you have asthma. So that's actually medium to low grade evidence, actually. Cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. If your patient has a DNR order, if your patient, you're trying to avoid extubation failure, here the evidence is slightly less, grade B evidence, and then low grade evidence in mild ARDS. This is still an evolving field. I would want you to remember the top three, COPD exacerbation, cardiogenic failure, and weaning after extubation in COPD patients. So that's the simple algorithm, which comes out again from a document from more than 10 years ago, but nothing has changed in this. If your pH is more than 7.35, there's no indication for non-invasive ventilation. However, if your patient has a pH of between 7.35 and 7.20, and it's isolated hypercapnic failure in a cooperative patient, we have good evidence that this approach of NIV works. If your pH is between 7.10 and 7.20 with isolated hypercapnic failure and a, co uh, and a cooperative patient, you can still use non-invasive ventilation. So think of contraindications of NIV before you put patients on NIV. However, if the patient has got a pH of 7.20, with coexistent comorbidities, so heart failure, for instance, uncontrolled diabetes, for instance, if there is a comorbidity, the clinician takes a call in trying NIV versus going straight for intubation. So I'll repeat that again. With a pH of less than 7.20, with an existing comorbidity, the clinician, the clinical team together, takes a decision about NIV versus intubation, and the data in this respect is still evolving and we could not definitely say either way straight for intubation versus straight for non-invasive ventilation. Of course, if there is a contraindication for NIV, you could try invasive mechanical ventilation straight away. So there's some flexibility in the dotted lines. In the blocked lines, there is a definite algorithm with grade A evidence. How do you decide whether your NIV is successful or unsuccessful? You would repeat an arterial blood gas analysis one to two hours after starting NIV, and you would repeat one again at about six to eight hours. The weaning process from NIV, like from invasive mechanical ventilation, has to be over a period of a few days, depending on the degree and grade of improvement. The patient gets weaned over a period of time. You give, give breaks in between NIV when the patient breathes spontaneously on a nasal cannula or on a face mask and over a period of time, making sure that the patient is not going back into respiratory acidosis, you wait for this patient to come back to spontaneous breathing. Hurry is not the motto. Slow and steady is the motto. You do not want to push your patient back into respiratory acidosis again. So that's the data about an IV summarized. And I want, to make, remember, want you to remember this one slide, even if you forget everything else. If you look at drugs, look at any drug, look at thrombolysis when it existed for patients with an MI, you needed to treat 42 patients to save one life when you thrombolyzed patients in the thrombolysis era. Compare this with non-invasive ventilation. The NIV prevents intubation in one out of five patients. The 20% cases, you would avoid invasive mechanical ventilation. And even more impressive, when you looked, look at life saved, the number needed to treat, treat it the number needed to treat is eight. So one patient, you save life out of eight when you give them non-invasive ventilation. And there isn't a drug, I would argue, in COPD or any chronic respiratory disease which can claim of numbers like NIV does. So don't forget your NIV. That's the bottom line. So what about non-invasive versus conventional ventilation to treat hypercapnic encephalopathy in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? This is conventional mechanical ventilation versus NIV. And you can see while the time taken to improvement is longer, with NIV, you reach the same endpoint when you're comparing about weaning as you do with conventional mechanical ventilation. So the numbers get better with conventional mechanical ventilation sooner, but over a period of time, when you compare numbers, 
your results with conventional mechanical ventilation and NIV when used for appropriate investigations are similar. So that's the good side, the positive side. Like anything else in life, there's obviously a negative side, which is the side of NIV failure. So let's spend a little bit of time, the next five minutes, talking about non-invasive ventilation failure. So when you talk about NIV failure, it would come in two broad categories. It would be ineffective ventilation and second, failure of synchronizing with the ventilator. The other way of looking at it is the timing of non-invasive ventilation failure. We'll come to causes, but let's look at timing first. The immediate failure, which happens when you put the mask on the patient's face, and then 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, the patient says that I want to come off the NIV. So within minutes. So here you call this immediate failure. Then you have the early failure, which forms the maximum bulk of failure for non-invasive ventilation. The earlier fail, early, early failure is between 48 hours, and this is about 70%. And then you have the late failure, which is another 15 to 17%, which is beyond the 48 hours. So let us look at the causes of early NIV failure. When we talk about early, we spoke about 48 hours. If there is failure within the first 48 hours, the patient would obviously get intubated at the very beginning. And this looks at various causes for early failure of non-invasive ventilation. And you can see the Apache score on there. You can see the FEV1. You can see the pH at two hours post-starting NIV when there's underlying pneumonia, etc. But the bottom line from the Scala paper says that the higher the comorbidity, the higher the severity of the comorbidity, or the higher the number of comorbidities, the higher is the failure rate with non-invasive ventilation. This another very beautiful paper from about five years ago, looking at risk factors in the emergency department. So again, looking at early failure, identifies two simple factors. If your age is above 65, and if your GCS is below 15, these in itself would be risk factors for failure of non-invasive ventilation. This looks at outcome of non-invasive ventilation in AECOPD in the U.S. for 10 years between 98 and 2008. So it's dated data, old data. However, it's still very relevant. And you can see the top yellow circles, the line with the yellow circles on it, shows you NIV failure with transfer to invasive mechanical ventilation. This is, again, early failure. And you can see it's to the tune of between 20 to 30% depending on which study you look at. So 20 to 30% of patients with NIV would get transferred onto invasive mechanical ventilation, irrespective of which study you looked at. So I would like to argue, and this is one of my favorite slides, I would like to argue that it's not NIV versus invasive mechanical ventilation. These are complementary. These support each other. Invasive mechanical ventilation is the backup when you are giving patients non-invasive ventilation and you're giving non-invasive ventilation because in a few, you might manage to avoid invasive mechanical ventilation and these complement each other and what you give depends on the severity of the underlying illness and also the number of comorbidities you have. That's an important take-home message on that particular slide. Think of the BTS guidelines, and the BTS guidelines give you indications of invasive mechanical ventilation. So these are indications where you should not delay escalation to invasive mechanical ventilation, where it's more appropriate, and you can see the indications on there. They are, these are common sense. Patients where respiratory arrest seems imminent. Patients who are severely tachypneic. There's air hunger. There's asynchrony with the ventilator. There are obvious contraindications to NIV or NIV has failed where the pH is less than 7.15 in spite of non-invasive ventilation at about two hours and where the Glasgow Coma scale is less than eight. So these are no-brainers. Here you know invasive mechanical ventilation is the way forward. So that's about early failure. Let's now look at late NIV failure and intubation. So like we said, late failure is after 48 hours. And this, again, looks at one of the papers with late failure. And here again, the number of patients who have a late failure, 
to go on to invasive mechanical ventilation post 48 hours of non-invasive ventilation is of the tune of 23%. So if you look at ICU mortality, 92% was the survival when patients continued NIV. So other way around, sorry. So if you continued patients on NIV, despite the need for invasive mechanical ventilation, the mortality was very high. If you tubed patient at the right time, even with early failure, you would have a mortality of 50%. So carry home message, one out of four patients after 48 hours of initiation of NIV would not need invasive mechanical ventilation. If you continued NIV at this juncture, when IMV is the way forward, 92%, so almost all your patients would die, and hence invasive mechanical ventilation in this group of patients as soon as it is mandated is important, and even there, the mortality is going to be significant. The risk factors for late failure here are important. Again, the degree of comorbidity, so you can see a high Apache score. If you have a very high CRP, it seems to be a prognostic marker for failure of non-invasive ventilation. You've spoken about a low Glasgow coma scale. Patients who are inherently intolerant to NIV are not good ones to give NIV to. Bronchiectasis and pneumonia, again, are important ones, especially in patients who are coughing and bringing up phlegm. If you keep the NIV mask on forever, it causes greater amount of plugging with atelectasis of lung segments, which increase the VQ mismatch. Hence, bronchiectasis and pneumonia are likely reasons of late failure of non-invasive ventilation. And absence of improvement of the PF ratio after two to eight hours of treatment with non-invasive ventilation is also a risk factor for late failure of NIV. In the last five minutes, I speak about the other two indications, the indications of obesity and neuromuscular disease. We spoke about the definition of acute hypercapnia in the context of each of these. So we go on straight into obesity, and you know with obesity, there's an overlap between obesity, sleep disorders, and acute respiratory failure. So when you think about obesity, think about increased bulk on the chest wall. And this is soft tissue on the chest wall, which restricts the movement of the lung. And there's increased work of breathing. There's an increased need from the patient, increased effort from the patient needed to augment minute ventilation to maintain adequate alveolar ventilation. If your patient has enough ventilatory dive and muscle power, to increase ventilatory dive, drive and minute ventilation, then the patient will be eucapnic. This will result in simple obesity, or if there's collapse of the upper airway, it might result in OSA. On the other side, if your patient cannot increase ventilatory drive to achieve a satisfactory minute ventilation, and there are various causes that you see on the box there, including leptin resistance, decreased muscle performance, and so on, the patient hypoventilates. And if the patient hypoventilates, there's hypercapnia, there's hypoxemia, and it satisfies the definition of obesity-related respiratory failure, hypercapnic respiratory failure that I spoke about. And here, you have mostly an overlap between OSA and OHS, so obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And in 10% of people, you would have pure obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And I want you to remember this algorithm. This is easy to remember and important for you to remember when you speak about patients in the obesity uh, compartment. These look at study where the early use of NIV in patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure was studied. Studies which are similar, and in both these studies, they found, understandably, that COPD was the commonest cause of acute hypercapnic failure, but then the important part, the fact that OHS, Obesity hypoventilation syndrome is the second most frequent indication, far lower than COPD, but the second commonest indication of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. So this is an entity to remember. These patients will come to you, especially in the current pandemic, not the pandemic of COVID-19, but the pandemic of obesity that the world is evidencing today, witnessing today. The evidence for non-invasive ventilation in, to treat patients with obesity in acute respiratory failure is of poor quality. And you can see that the studies are mainly based 
on case series, cohort studies, case control studies, etc. However, obesity hyperventilation does figure here as a known entity, an effective entity in the treatment of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. So if you look at the BTS guidelines, you can see that in patients with obesity hyperventilation, NIV should be started in hypercapnic acute respiratory failure using the same criteria as we used in acute exacerbation of COPD. And this is something you know. The second indication, again, to reiterate, we've said this earlier in the talk, that in some patients, if the patient has daytime somnolence, and if the PaCO2 is more than 6 kilopascals, and the patient has sleep disordered breathing, with or without the presence of right heart failure, the indication for using NIV in this population of patients is a great deal evidence, but from observational studies, seems to be effective. What's the influence of severe obesity on NIV strategies and responses in patients with acute respiratory failure attacks in ICU? So these are NIV strategies in the obese and the non-obese compared together and whether any change of strategy is needed. I want you to see the blue box at the bottom and remember it. So a longer time is needed in the obese population especially the severe obese population with a BMI of more than 35 for normalization of PaCO2. The normalization of PaCO2 takes longer and a higher PEEP is needed in these patients. However, the rate of intubation, the length of stay and the mortality remains the same in both groups. This was a lovely study. This again is from about eight years ago, but a lovely study which looks at obesity hyperventilation and COPD and trying to phenotype patients. And you can see there's a lot of differences in the COPD population versus the obesity hyperventilation population. So the population of patients with OHS are older than COPD. There's a greater number of females as compared to COPD where there's a male predominance. The BMI obviously is greater in the obesity hyperventilation fragment. The number of smokers are much lower in the OHS population. The lung function is going to be bigger, better in the OHS population, again, understandably. The FEV1, FVC ratio shows more of restriction in the OHS category and more of obstruction in the COPD category. So there's a lot that you can do to phenotype these two apart, even though we know there's a lot of overlap between COPD and OHS. What about survival? Interestingly, in OHS, the survival with NIV seems to be better as compared to what it is in the COPD category of patients. And this looks at long-term one-year survival. And you can see even in the long term, the survival becomes better with long-term use of NIV in OHS as compared to COPD. What about failure rates in obesity? And you can see that it is more to do with late NIV failure in obesity as compared to early failure. So there's very little of early failure. There's more of late failure in patients with obesity hyperventilation syndrome. Again, this is a flow diagram that I want you to remember. And it shows what I have told you already. So this is patients with obesity hyperventilation, a small number of patients. You're not going to get large numbers with studies in OHS. So 76 patients. If you had early failure and 13 patients out of 76 had early NIV failure, you can see that almost all the patients bar one died in this category. So early failure of NIV in obesity hyperventilation is a poor prognostic marker and happens in a lesser number of patients. If you have early NIV success, which was the remaining 63 patients, there might be an immediate response in a significant number. If there is an immediate success, then most of the patients where NIV has been successful early would be alive at the end of treatment. If there's a delayed response, and you can see that there is a late NIV failure of about 7 out of 33 patients who had a late NIV failure, most patients who had late NIV failure would be dead when you try and treat these patients long term with non-invasive ventilation. However, if NIV is successful, even with a late response, most of your patients could be alive. And that's an algorithm to remember about early versus late failure in these patients. What about determinants of late failure? And again, 
rather than going into the fine print on there, I want you to remember the take home message, which is if there's multi organ failure and if there's pneumonia, these are the important factors which are associated with hypoxemic respiratory failure and death in patients with non invasive ventilation who has obesity hyperventilation syndrome. So that's the summary of OHS. The fact that the prevalence of OHS is strongly related with the prevalence of and severity of obesity. Both CPAP and NIV improve outcome. However, long-term trials are lacking. Prospective observational studies show good response to NIV in acute response setting. There is a degree of early failure and late failure. However, these are not large in number. However, if there is failure, the mortality rate is going to be high in this population of patients. The last, which is about NIV and secretion management in neuromuscular disease, I won't speak at length about this. However, the fact that intermittent NIV, not just during the asleep state, but also when the patient is awake, helps in reconditioning of respiratory muscles, help them to do better physiotherapy, the cuffacist works better, and you have to do less bronchoscopies to try and increase clearance of phlegm. The more the intensive, more intensive the use of NIV, the greater, the better the results of in uh, progressive neuromuscular diseases. There is often oxygen along, given along with NIV, with an aim of maintaining saturations above 94%. Make sure that you adjust settings so that the PCO2 remains low in these patients. You might be able to increase following efficiency with this, like we said. If you humidify, the sputum might become, become less tenacious, and it's not NIV versus physiotherapy. It's always NIV plus physiotherapy when you treat these patients. The last bit is about advanced directives, and here we know that advanced directives are in patients who are for palliative care, and this is especially important in the umbrella of neuromuscular disease. This is still something we do poorly in our lot of patients. This is especially relevant in patients with motor neuron disease. Physicians are more likely to be talking about this in Western countries as compared to ours, and we need to change this mindset. We need to discuss factors like intubation, end of life care, at least in this cohort of patients, so that these patients can express their desires from before, before they go into acute hypercapnic failure. A lot of these patients would not want intubation and ventilation, and this is something that needs to be fixed with the patient and the family much before they become acutely unwell, maybe from a respiratory infection. So the last conclusion remarks from my side is that NIV is of benefit without doubt in patients with acute hypercapnic failure. It avoids intubation, it improves survival rate, it reduces all the complications of invasive mechanical ventilation. However, implementation, not just in COPD, but also within the umbrella of neuromuscular disease and obesity needs further improvement. Training is essential not just for the doctors, but also for the paramedical staff, because how well you use the mask, how well the mask fits, how much the leakage is, are all factors which will determine the success or failure of non-invasive ventilation. And for patients who are on home non-invasive ventilation in the long term, follow-up of these patients is very, very important. And this would be discussed in one of the future lectures on a module. Thank you very much for listening to me. Go. So good evening, everyone. And thank you uh, very much, uh, Raja, for that excellent talk on acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. We'll move on to the next talk, uh, followed by Q&A. And so as not to waste much time, I think uh, Rajesh Swankar, my colleague in Nagpur, is a face very familiar to respiratory physicians across India. Uh, just like me, he's battling the other end of Maharashtra in COVID right now. And uh, we are having a, uh, an interesting, fascinating, and challenging time in practice. Uh, Rajesh is going to take us. Uh, Rajesh is the... Uh, Director of Pulmonology at Getwell Hospital, uh, and he is also the Secretary of the Indian Chess Society and has done a phenomenal job in enhancing both the society and education uh, in respiratory medicine across the country. So 
without much ado, I'd, uh, Rajesh, over to you to take us through a clinical case discussion, and then we'll do the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Suji. Uh, so after the talk, uh, the Dr. Raja has elucidated very well about acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. Let's have a case of discussion, uh, which we'll just discuss some practical points. And uh, we'll have also some questions in between, which will be thrown as a poll. And we would like audience interaction on that. And uh, we would all. Hello. So I'm sharing my presentation. I'm sharing, I'm sharing the case. So is my slide now visible? Hello, well visible. visible. Well visible. All right. So uh, this is a case discussion that I want you to go through, and it's very simple, uh, but it will test our practicability of, I think, using an IV in acute hypercaptic respiratory failure. So this is a case of a 50-year-old COPD patient who's been treated uh, with ICS LABA as well as LAMA. And he has presented to casualty with complaints of increased dry cough as well as breathlessness since about four days. On examination, the patient is conscious but is, but is also cyanosed. He's a febrile. The pulse is 110 per minute, regular. He is quite uh, cachypnic with a respiratory rate of 36 per minute. On this examination, now the respiratory system, it is seen that he has got bilateral ronchi. And his S2 to a room air is about 84%. So, these are the investigations that are available uh, with hemoglobin of 16 gram per deciliter. The total count is 8,100. And his ABG, which was taken in the casualty, shows that pH is 7.28. The PSO2 is 68 millimeter of Hg. O2 is about 56 millimeter of Hg. HCO3 is 39. And his previous 2D echo of a report is available, which shows that it is he has got moderate pulmonary artery hypertension as well. The X-ray done uh, shows that he has got a hyperinflated lung. So this is my first uh, interactive question that to all of you is that what would be the best initial treatment for this patient who has come to you? Uh, the options are uh, invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, B is an IV with oxygen with bronchodilator with systemic steroids, the C is O2 inhalation at 5 liters per minute with of course bronchodilator and steroids, and the option D that you just treat him with oxygen inhalation at 2 liters per minute with of course bronchodilator as well as system storage. So if I can ask my support team to just run the poll for the audience on this option. Support team. Poll has been launched. Right. 
I hope that we are getting the answers. So, uh, most of uh, you have understood the question very well. It's a very straightaway case. Uh, and about, uh, do we have the result or I should go away? I should just go, uh, I should give the answers. Support team. Sir, please give the answers. Right. So, most of you have basically clicked on answer B, of course. So, what I want to say is that, yes, answer is uh, B, that you would optimize the, of course, medical therapy for this patient, and you would, of course, treat him with also bronchodilators as well as systemic steroids. But, of course, NIV would be a factor that is going to improve him. So, of course, uh, we chose this NIV with all of support therapy. And uh, there, are, there were more options like giving plain uh, high-flow oxygen uh, but in a patient of COPD exacerbation, this will, of course, lead to decrease in hypoxemic drive and can also lead to hypercapnia. So if we give oxygen with an IV, it will not only lead to proper oxidation, but also CO2 washout. And as of Dr. Raja, that is also told in his lecture that an IV can be safely used in an initial trial uh, with pH between 7.10 to 7.35. And we can manage the patient for up to PACO2 of up to less than 90. So now I give a twist in this case, in the sense that I had not told you the weight of this patient. So obviously he's 50 year old and he's a chronic smoker. But he is now also an obese patient with a BMI of 41, suffering COPD as well. And after his NIV therapy, when he was quite well, even that time, his awake room air ABG uh, had pH of 7.34, the PO2 was 70, PACO2 of 52, HCO3 of 32, and of course, eco done at that time also should it RARV is of dilated, and uh, he has got moderate pH. So, what is the best clinical diagnosis that would be for this patient? Would you still treat him as COPD with ongoing acute exacerbation? This is a patient with COPD with core pulmonale, or he is a patient with COPD with obesity hypermotivation syndrome with core pulmonale, or of course it is OHS with core pulmonale. So these are the four options for ABCD. The support team, if you could launch the poll for the poll launched. So obviously this patient was actually treated in ICU and he actually improved very well. Uh, but even after improvement, when we do his ABG, he is still having his PSO2 a bit high. And these are the parameters that have come into fore. And uh, what would be the best clinical diagnosis that you would make for this patient? I have been told that the answer would come to my, I think, WhatsApp. It can't be launched on the screen. So, uh, it's really good. A hard thing to say that 85% of uh, audience have uh, pulled for this uh, answer C, which is uh, COPD with obesity hyperventilation syndrome uh, with uh, core pulmonary. So this is the right answer, and it's very simple that you have to consider obesity hypoventilation syndrome in a patient whose BMI is more than 35, uh, his awake room air ABG showing alveolar hypoventilation with PSU2 of more than 45 millimeter of Hg, which actually signifies that he is having daytime hypercapnia. So next. Uh, would be if suppose this patient is there and uh, what settings or more is likely to benefit him. 
So he is now an obese patient with obesity hyperventilation syndrome and he has got coexisting COPD. So these are the simple settings on an IV, which one you would choose among A, B, C, D, like IPAP of 12 or EPAP of 4, or you would increase IPAP to 20 and EPAP to 8, or you, you would just simply give him plain CPAP of 10, or you would go for invasive mechanical ventilation, saying that he has got a failed NIV a trial. So I think support team, if you could launch the poll for the audience. That launched. So uh, in our clinical setup, we usually don't get a very clear-cut case of COPD or this thing. We, you, we may get such overlapping syndromes, and uh, we have to take care of them and uh, also adjust our therapy as per their, their presentation. So... Uh, so that's good. Hurting to know, 89% uh, people have said that we have to increase the IPAP to 20 and uh, EPAP of ACT, and we will consider each option and why it is so. As you all know that patients uh, with COPD and OPCT hypertension stroke have less thoracic compliance and altered also ventilatory control and the high upper wear of resistance. Hence, uh, actually, they would need higher IPAP and EPAP to maintain optimal pH. And additionally, all obesity hypertension patients should be investigated for co also existing OSAs because they have got obstructive sleep apnea as well. And then CPAP alone will not suffice. And uh, this is not the patient for invasive mechanical ventilation. And as also it was elucidated in the previous talk. IMV entails risk of infection and also prolonged hospitalization. Uh, just to uh, have another this thing, uh, because now this patient has improved from his acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, but is showing a daytime hypercapnia because of his coexisting obesity hypertension syndrome. He still has his PSO2 higher, and his pH is just stabilizing, 7.34, 7.35. So if suppose you want to discharge this patient from the uh, basically ICU, uh, and then you would like to plan his uh, long-term treatment, not long-term because these patients are again called after about four to six weeks to reassess, but what would the best long-term treatment and what it should include? We can just discharge him with uh, home oxygen alone or with just giving only NIV through which he has improved or both oxygen with NIV or just extend him and just wait and observe what happens next. Support team, can you launch the poll for the audience? The poll has been launched. So it's very important uh, to see that uh, these patients do not get hospitalized because these are also called as revolving door patients. They would come often, they would get admitted again and again, and especially with patients who have got this coarse morbid conditions like obesity, amortization syndrome, COPD, effective sleep apnea. So uh, you have to give them some treatment that would prevent their uh, because frequent hospitalization in ICUs. So uh, I hope we have got the course answers.
ओके तो पीपल हैव एन ऑक्सीजन विद एनआईवी एंड देयर इज अ डिवीजन तो समा सिंह जस्ट होम ऑक्सीजन अलोन एंड ट्वेंटी टू परसेंट आर सेंग दैट ओनली एन आई वी इट इज सिक्सटी नाइन परसेंट फॉर सींग ऑक्सीजन विथ एन आई वी इन द फाइनल फोर सो दैट्स रियली गुड एंड रियली थिंक दैट पीपल हैव अंडरस्टूड आई थिंक डॉक्टर राजा लेक्चर वेरी वेल तो वाई दिस ऑक्सीजन द आंसर सी इज राइट दैट इज यू हैव टू प्लान विथ ऑक्सीजन विथ एन आई वी because uh, copd may exacerbate the symptoms and uh, signs of obesity hypoventilation syndrome because both these diseases impair alveolar or ventilation and they increase the work of breathing so it is of course reasonable to perform spirometry in a first patient with obesity hypoventilation syndrome in order to detect coexisting copd and uh, treatment of obesity hypoventilation syndrome is indicated uh, for all patient who are found to have coexisting copd uh just as a last uh, interactive question that uh, i would like to ask that what are the investigation we like to advise in this uh, in this patient uh the options are six med walk test tlco deep study or all of the above the poll team can you launch the poll Sir, launched. So once this patient have got stabilized in ICU and they are now in, I think, higher intensive unit or in their respective rooms or wards. Uh, before just sending them, you would like to see some parameters, which would really tell you how this patient would behave, and to advise about, I think, the correct therapy that they get before they go home. okay so most of them say and that's the tendency of the audience whenever there is a question of uh, with all of the above uh, they would vote for it mostly so most of them 56% have voted for all of the above but uh, the right answer is actually deep study because as i had already told you in my in fact case discussion i given the answer that this obesity hypertension syndrome people patients also have basically sleep obstructive sleep apnea syndrome and has to be investigated for this uh, actually just to optimize their treatment before they go home so uh, sleep study is advisable as up to 40% of ohs patient uh, will also have uh, coexisting oss so audience uh, you have fared quite well and uh, raja hats off to you for your explanation people have fared well and i would stop sharing my presentation now and uh, hand over to dr sujit hi <clears throat> thanks um, thanks rajesh and uh, since we are running a bit late we will quickly introduce our other panel uh, excellent case i think it brought out the basics very very well and uh, you know following raja's talk i think it's completed uh, the talk the subject of acute hypercapnic failure uh, we have some questions and they'll keep coming in and we have an assessment at the end but we have about 20 minutes uh, for a panel uh, now which uh, i will introduce to dr vijay hadda who's associate professor in pulmonary and critical care and sleep medicine at all india institute in delhi and uh, very dear friend from for many years dr sk madhukar was a director and senior consultant pulmonologist at the madhukar clinic and lung hospital in patna so welcome to both of you all and uh, uh, and uh, uh, nice to have you all all four here on this panel now uh, the first question uh, that i would get across straight away uh, and probably to 
to Vijay here is in type 2 acute respiratory failure, uh, I think a question that many young postgraduates have because they read so much about NIV is that they sometimes, uh, Vijay, forget about oxygen. So should you always give NIV with oxygen? What's your take there, Vijay? A very interesting question. And I think uh, whenever a patient comes in emergency or maybe ICU, and you see the right. patient in respiratory failure, so if right. by some clinical indicator or some lab parameter, if we can classify them in type 1 versus type 2 respiratory failure, then most of the things are settled. So I think at that point of time, pulse oximetry is very, very helpful. So if, if the patient is having a pulse oximeter saturation of, let us say, more than 92, then things are very easy. The patient do not require oxygen profile. But if the patient is having hypoxemia, indicated by SpO2 of less than 90, that is a catching kind of situation. And I would suggest in such cases, you should start oxygen simultaneously and try to be as low as possible to keep the saturation in tune of maybe 90 to 92%. Note like that we will target 96 or 98 percent like that. So uh, message is simple. If patient is having normal SpO2, maybe 90 or 92, especially in patient with COPD, even 88 is acceptable. So if this kind of hypoxemia is there, then there is no need of oxygen. But if patient is having low saturation with 88 percent or less, those patient will require oxygen and always start with low flow. Usually we give around two to three liter per minute. And in most of the patient that is suffice. I think I think that's that's very important. And that's very important from the clinical standpoint, you know, that you use oxygen carefully in these patients. And sometimes you could get away just without uh, oxygen at all. You may just need NIV. But that's probably a smaller percentage of patients who come in acute hypercapnic failure. Most of them just get bombarded with oxygen uh, and NIV. And Raja, you were talking about that part in your talk, you know, about where to maintain. And I think Rajesh also put up a slide, 5 liters, 10 liters per minute oxygen. I think you would target probably in type 2 hypercapnic failure, just what Vijay said somewhere would you agree somewhere in the 88 to 94 regions, which is what I normally put down on, on file, but which often doesn't get followed because someone just loves the figure of 99. <laughs> what is your take, Raja? So completely agree, Sujit. I think uh, go along with what all of you have said. I think I would even target a bit lower. So people who are hypercaptic by nature, I think it's important right. that you target somewhere between 85 to 90. I know the book teaching says 88 to 92. The intensive care right. is probably the most delicate place in all this because the intensivists, um, the anesthetists, actually love a saturation of 100%. So uh, that's right. what they always get for. That's what they go for. And it's very important yeah. to actually drive the point that Vijay was driving, that it's important to maintain low rather than going high. Yeah. Obviously, we don't want less sure. than 85, but probably 90, 92 would be my upper limit, like you said. Sure. I think it's very interesting. We've been telling our our resident doctors this all the time for COPD and now suddenly with COVID-19 you want those saturations much higher than that and you're seeing a, a different mindset that you need to work with you know in the ICU but it's it's important that these patients are different. Um, uh, Madhukar, um, what are the conditions in which you commonly see in clinical practice at your hospital acute hypercapnic respiratory failure though Raja did dwell on this could you give your clinical perspective on acute hypercapnic respiratory failure? What are the commonest conditions? Uh, you're muted, Madhukar. Your, your sound is not coming across. Yeah, Dr. Suzit, I think the most common yeah. cause of respiratory failure in the lung disease is usually the VQ mismatch. And those patients who have the respiratory muscles at disadvantage, mechanically disadvantaged uh, respiratory muscles. Those patients are not able to uh, drive a minute ventilation sufficient enough to produce effective alveolar ventilation. And those are the patient groups who are at risk of developing type 2 respiratory failure. And as Dr. Radhadar mentioned in his talk, 
the most common uh, patients who are going to develop acute hypercapnic respiratory failure are COPD, and the patients with bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, uh, obesity, hyperventilation, and not to forget the neuromuscular disease and the severe chest wall deformities. So these are the patients who have mechanically disadvantaged uh, respiratory muscles, and therefore they cannot uh, really uh, increase the minute ventilation sufficient enough to produce the effective alveolar ventilation, and that leads to the hypercapnic respiratory failure. Yeah. Um, that's, that, that covers the, the gist of, of the, the patient population. Uh, there's another question um, to you, Rajesh. PO2 and PCO2 both up on the blood gas. Um, any messages to our resident doctors who see high PO2s and high PCO2s? When you're give, yeah, instituting so NPV. Yeah, so as residents or some um, very enthusiastic uh, intensivists would like to chase this SpO2 to be high, we may use basically oxygen uh, to a higher level, and I think also maybe your IPAP would be high. So this would entail the EBG, which will be showing that he is actually losing the uh, drive and his, and his CO2 is increasing. Sure. So, Raja, you want to? So, Sujit, can I make a quick point? So, a couple yeah, of quick sure, points. Sure, sure. So, Madhukar made a very important point, point, which I would like to dwell on as a part of hypercapnia. So, you know, the patients yes. that you're weaning from invasive mechanical ventilation who got extubated and get onto right. NIV, Madhukar made the point about respiratory muscle weakness, and these patients became being hypercapnic. So, I think that's another population where you have to actually monitor the CO2 carefully because often with the passage of time, these people hypoventilate because they have respiratory muscle weakness due to ICU myopathy, et cetera. These people actually start retaining carbon dioxide and they sort of become hypercapnic and go into acidotic respiratory failure. That's another sure. population. Um, the other point to add to what Rajesh said, I think it's a classic situation you see when people come in in an ambulance with hypercapnic failure, isn't it? They come in right. with a non rebreath 15 liters of oxygen. You find a PO2 of 250. You find a PCO2 of 100 and a pH of 7.01. Right. And these people, right. people are unconscious and they go on to a tube and a vent as soon as they come to the emergency. So that's a classic scenario. Right. But we yeah. see that sure. everywhere at the hospital from time to time. Time to time. Right. Vijay, um, what clinical and lab parameters would you advise? using to indicate success of NIV. So if you had to really um, believe your NIV is working in those critical first 48 hours, what would be the parameters we should look at? Yeah. Um, actually, yesterday also we were discussing about this, that NIV right. is not a therapy where you just start and run away. It's like a therapy where you require a continuous kind of monitoring and probably for first few minutes, at least half an hour, you are required to the bedside. So when you are bedside, you will look for some clinical indicators and subsequently maybe some blood gas analysis and maybe some kind of ventilatory parameter. These all things we keep on monitoring continuously. So if once we have started NIV and patient by look, we can make out whether he's comfortable or not. I think that is the first thing. Once if our settings are right, the patient will start becoming comfortable after just maybe five or 10 minutes. So that is probably the first indicator that our therapy is working. Then subsequently, we can see the respiratory rate, then there is the use of accessory muscles. This will also come down. And down the line, maybe at the around somewhere, around two hours or so, depending on your institute wise, in our uh, practice, we usually repeat ABG after two hours. And if ABG is also showing that there is some improvement in pH, as well as at least PCO2 is not rising. Not rising is important. It's, it may not be normal, but at least it, it should not rise. So if that is there, right. then we again say that on blood gases also, the therapy is effective. And then subsequently, maybe... 20, by 24 hours or so, we will be very, very sure that whether this therapy is successful or not. And uh, oh. uh, depending on this clinical as well as the blood gas parameters, 
and if somebody sure. fails most of the time as dr rajadhar explained beautifully in the presentation that most of patient if fail they will be in initial phase initial 2 hours are very crucial and subsequently they told it that most of the time is not because of nive failure probably something else is there which is causing nive failure if something is failing nib after let us say 48 hours so that may not be primary nive failure probably there is something else is happening so that may be reason for nive failure oh. uh any difference uh, question has come up from the audience any difference in the nive settings for covid 19 respiratory failure i know that's usually not hypercapnic respiratory failure but sometimes can be any difference in your strategy vijay and anyone else would like to comment after vijay uh, i think niv is used by almost everyone although little bit with scared kind of approach that we don't want to use niv but i think use and practice varies from uh, i think center to center and even person to person there is no consensus till now but i think the the same setting what we use for ards that kind of settings can be used here also so uh, i have not very much experience because in our center most of the patients are managed by anesthesia team in icu so if sure, you ask sure. me the personal experience i have zero experience i can accept sure. it so anyone maybe like to... you, you you people yeah. may be more by no. that No worries, uh, Raja. I'm so, sure you have something from Fortis to tell us about. So, <laughs> just, Madhukar, I mean, I think I think when we started off this journey with COVID, yeah. there was right. a lot of concern about the use of HFNO and non-invasive ventilation because of sure. the role of aerosol generation, and there was a sure. lot of literature which came out about ventilating people early because a this was a safe method of trying to avoid aerosol generation, and b people felt that if you ventilated right. people early the chances of getting people back was greater then you had the us data which showed an 88% mortality and now we've all come to try a period of non invasive ventilation in people with covid i think a moderate peep is what you try like you said you don't worry about hypercapnia here your patients are tachypneic they're probably going at somewhere between 30 to 40 and uh, uh, respiratory rate of between 30 to 40 a minute it's very difficult to actually get these patients to synchronize with the non invasive ventilator because they are so tachypneic so it's pressure support it's low pressures a peep which is modest you probably wouldn't manage like the ards scenario a very high peep in these individuals because they don't manage to keep the non invasive ventilation on and often you would use an anxiolytic of some description like dexamethasone especially early on to try and get these people to synchronize with the vent otherwise they find it very very uncomfortable i have often yeah. found that hf is more acceptable to these patients as compared to what niv is they tend to synchronize better they tend to breathe better on the hfno but we use hfno and uh, niv in quite a lot of patients who are imminently going on to the vent our experience with invasive mechanical ventilation in covid is also quite poor so um that's the gist of it uh, sir so ji yeah. so madhukar from patna any thoughts rajesh please please go ahead. yeah and uh, uh, another word of uh, caution about interface in fact that uh, if you have if you're giving an iv what we used to see in you know italian icus and all is to have a helmet uh, helmet mask so they were not actually basically available and they were supposed to be very costly uh, but now uh, i have i've been told that they are available in india uh, but i don't know its effect on basically ventilation because these helmet masks even if they are cheaper or something if we use that would also increase what is called dead space and uh, would also basically increase the trigger sensitivity and uh, maybe as a pressure effect would also i think but very with this way just using this helmet mask so i think a word about that is also to be taken care of if you're using these masks sure. which are not available i was told that in india sure, uh, sure. very a very important practical points that i would like to add for niv in covid pneumonia patients sir the first is if your patient is uh, have the risk factor for developing hypercapnia or if the patient has developed hypercapnia then in these situations if you are using niv your target oxygen saturation should be 88 to 92 rather than the usual 94 to 90 this is, this has to be kept in mind the second is 
if you are using an IV, you must uh, assess the patient's compliance. If the patient's compliance is good, uh, the delivered tidal volume up to eight can be fine. But if your patient's compliance is poor in COVID pneumonia, you are using an IV. Always have a check on the tidal volume, delivered tidal volume, and you have to keep it around six ml per kg, as as Dr. Vijayhad just told that you, you you have to adopt a protective lung ventilation strategy when the patient's compliance, lung compliance is poor. And the third is. Uh, if your patient is on NIV and you are having giving an NIV break to these kind of patients and during the NIV break, the COVID pneumonia patients uh, desaturates very rapidly, then it becomes an indication for invasive mechanical clinical. You should not unnecessarily prolong those patients on it. So these three practical points that you uh, like to add sure. in COVID. Sure. sure, excellent points. Yeah. Uh, Another, we have about three or four minutes more for questions, so I'll quickly do a few more. How is it best to feed a patient on NIV? Madhukar, any thought? Do you encourage oral feeding or do you prefer putting in a nasogastric tube? I always like to prefer uh, internal feeding or oral feeding for the patients. And sure. the best way to feed internally, uh, internally for these patients are do, feeding during the NIV break. When you're applying the NIV break, you should encourage internal feeding for these kind of patients. If your patient is having thick distension because of the NIV, then you would like to put a nasogastric tube for these patients for the decompensation, and that can help the patient for, for the nutrition also. Sure. There's a question on obesity, hypoventilation. Raja, maybe you'd like to take it. If the patient is morbidly obese and has evidence of chronic type 2 respiratory failure, compensated with hypoxia, Corrected on 28% oxygen, would you still give NIV and oxygen or only oxygen? How would you decide that in a, in a morbidly obese patient? So, Sujit, I take it we are asked, or talking about the acute scenario here because you could yes, discuss yeah. even in the chronic scenario. So, so I think yeah, they... so the questioner has mentioned compensated with hypoxia corrected on 28 So, I guess only the oxygen is compensated with the 28% oxygen. I'm not convinced sure. the hypercapnia is compensated. Yes. Sure. Sure. So I think the important factor here is that you need higher pressures for these people when you're using non-invasive ventilation. So both your IPAP and EPAP need to be higher. The time sure. period to try and correct the carbon dioxide, the PCO2 here will be longer. The time period to try and get the pH corrected is going to be longer. However, there is no data to show that the actual length of stay or the mortality, etc., are going to be any worse in this population of patients as compared to what it is in the population of patients who are not morbidly obese. The yeah. PO you're looking for here also has to be conservative. So we spoke about 85 to 90 percent. Again, in this population of patients, we'd be perfectly happy with a saturation of between 85 to 90 percent or a PO2, which is somewhere between 50 to 60. Um, yeah. If you're going the chronic scenario, I guess the oxygen supplementation needs to continue. But here you aim for the saturation or the PO2 rather than aiming for a number that you are trying to correct. Sure. Rajesh, any thought uh, on NIV in, with a pneumothorax and an ICD? How would you, uh, you know, the pros and cons of it? It's always something that comes up, you know. How long yeah, should so, you give it? So... Usually what we do is if patient is pneumothorax, you have to, you have to just compress it. Uh, basically the air has to be of let out. So you have to first do intercostal drainage. That is, that is of course must. And uh, uh, I think there are very few studies which would say that they would cause a barotrauma with, with of course IPIP that we use. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't usually cause of so much of barotrauma that it would, it would cause problem. But if suppose there is ICD, in place, I think that can be just taken care of, and I think you should not worry about any any of the blood trauma which would arise because of NIV giving no. of those those of the pressure that we use usually up to about 20. I think it's quite safe. No. A final two questions uh, from Pune. We have a question on thromboembolism uh, and NIV. So uh, NIV in COPD with thromboembolism. So I guess the answer to that would be treated just like acute hypercapnic failure in COPD. But Vijay, you had a thought. Thromboembolism, I guess the hypoxia will take a little longer to resolve, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I think you have summarized well, sir. There is no need to change any kind of setting for that. Just sure. normal COPD management, whatever you are doing, you follow that right. uh, same principle here also. And a quick word from all of you all on well, uh, maybe a few seconds each on how to decide a patient would probably move to home and IV. I think that's a very critical question because uh, uh, in our part of Mumbai, with a lot of wealthy people, a lot of people just get prescribed an NIV machine to take home or rent at home. Is there any parameter from your side uh, that you would, starting with Vijay and moving anti-clockwise, what would you decide uh, as a good parameter to consider home and IV after acute management? So, uh, uh, I think uh, primary and diagnosis is most important thing. So uh, right. probably you are discussing in terms of maybe COPD. In right. like apnea hypopnea syndrome, there is no no confusion. So most of the patients sure. will be benefited with tap therapy, so they will require. But I think Correct. the COPD is one disease where most of the time, as a clinician, we are confused or not confused, exactly not sure what is going right. to happen with this patient. So many times we take a middle path in in, in our institute because. Many times patients remain for a long time in hospital and probably charges are not so high then we can keep patient and still can wait whether sure. this patient can be weaned from NIV or not. But there are situations where patient cannot be kept in hospital for longer period just to see whether right. he will require long term NIV or not. In that kind of situation probably you can discharge patient with NIV and maybe after some time maybe three to six weeks period or maybe four to six weeks later we can reassess whether this patient re will require NIV or not. I think that is so one approach we most of us are following. So probably ask them to use it at home on a rental basis or something and then review yeah, the... More, more, need most of the time we are doing the same thing. At least one month you take on rent and after yeah. one month you will reassess. Madhukar, so, would you agree uh, with that? Yeah, uh, we have approximately 12 studies, not very powerful studies to uh, assess the need of home NIV in the patients with uh, COPD acute exacerbation. Most of the patients of COPD acute hypercapnic failure will wean from NIV within few days. But if the patient requires NIV for more than a week with acute hypercapnic failure, then these are the group of the patients who are likely to be benefited from home NIV. The second is any patients with acute hypercapnic failure COPD at the time of discharge should undergo a spirometric test and ABG at room air. And if the PaO2 is less than 55, then the ABG should be repeated at three weeks. And even after, at three weeks, if the PaO2 is less than 55, this considers indication for oxygen therapy with keeping target of 88 to 92. But what happens in some of the patients Achieving this much of targeted oxygen also leads to oxygen-induced hypercapnia. So if during this process the patient develops hypercapnia, then these are the second group of patients who will be benefited from nocturnal home NIV. And the third group of patients are the patients who have more than three exacerbations requiring, requiring ventilatory assistance uh, in the last one year. Then these are the group of the patients who are benefited with home NIV keeping in mind that home NIV does not have mortality benefit, rather than it reduces the rate of hospital readmission uh, to a great extent, and which uh, sure. is of immense value to our patients in clinical practice. So what we call the revolving door admissions, they keep coming in and you see a roller there. I've never been fully convinced about that, but yes, I agree with you. I have colleagues who use it in that setting. Raja, home NIV sure. thresholds. So I, so I know this is something very close to your heart also, Sujit. So I'll probably say something which you would have said. So I think there are two indications, broad indications. One is the indication that Madhukar spoke about just now. Obviously, there's the practical indication which I spoke about, which is not managing to wean people in hospital and hospitals sure. being expensive, then going back home on an ID and then coming back to see how much the PCO is corrected. So I'll keep that outside. But aside from that, two indications. One is the revolving door patients. I knew from 2000 onwards, when Paul Plant actually published in Thorax his seminal paper about lack of reduction of mortality in patients 
who actually go on to home NIV because they keep getting admitted with type 2 respiratory failure. And then you had the Windish paper which came out in 2014. So from 2014 onwards, the concept changed from trying to give people NIV to reduce hospital admissions to trying to reduce the PCO2 by a certain number. And if you manage to reduce the PCO2 by a certain number, it was seen that there was a mortality benefit as a result of it. But this is high pressure and which is very different to the concept that we are talking about today. And we'll actually speak more about this as we go along in this module. So one is home NIV with the intention of bringing carbon dioxide down, higher pressures. The other is the revolving door see that uh, Madhukar spoke about. And I think you do them different ways like we've just pointed sure. out. Sure. Rajesh, any anything to add to the? Yeah, so there is a specific paper like ERS Task Force, which has actually addressed only about this home NIV use, which was published in 2019, in fact. And uh, they have they have looked at this what's called stable hypercaptic patients. So there, so 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 there is a use of NIV in this in this of stable hypercaptic patients, and they have actually given the recommendation for their home NIV for the same reason which Dr. Raya said. That of course they would be hospitalized again and again. So they would, so they are called revolving door patients. They would, they would go out, come again in ICU. So even in this stable hypercapnic patients after discharge, they of course can be given home, home and have benefit and a titration has to be done in the hospital. And this is true for especially those patients who have actually improved their acute exhibition with the aid of NIV. So those who have got a benefit with NIV. And they were just treated well with this equity, equity exhibition. They actually should be actually given the benefit. And of course, uh, they have to come back after two to four weeks to, of course, have a reassessment whether they would need it further or not. So for nothing stable, hypercapnic ERS Task Force 2019 has got some recommendation. Although they have said that there are no mortality benefits, is what experimental report has said. But uh, but uh, that would, of course, would reduce hospitalization. So I think um, that that's an interesting, and I think further on in this module, as Raja rightly said, we'll probably be discussing much more on home NIV, and we have to thank uh, uh, ResMed and the Indian Chess Society for supporting such a module on NIV. Uh, it, it was something that was non-existent when I was a postgraduate student, and sort of was just evolving. Uh, and now you can't you can't have an IQ without it. So. Uh, uh, I will just go to the five assessment questions quickly. Can we have them uh, on? Uh, can we show the assessment questions? Yeah, and this is for uh, all of you all who are tuning in, tuning in, so that you can uh, earn your buck for your certificates. The benefits of NIV usage, um, and this is a question you need to answer. Are Largely for NIV increases intubation risk. Uh, I, I mean, the benefits of NIV usage are all except NIV increasing intubation risk. Higher comorbidities in COPD leads to higher failure rate of NIV. NIV reduces the length of stay and frequent hospitalization. NIV reduces nosocomial infections. So. All of these are benefits of NIV, except which one? And you have a minute to answer that before we go to the next one. So I think we don't need to answer these questions because these are assessment questions. And uh, these can be taken up even afterwards when this uh, the webinar link is available on the uh, website. So we, so we should not give the answers. OK, we won't give the answers. Done. <laughs> so we won't give the answers. Question number two. OK, are we done with question number one? Right, so question number two for everyone. An IV in acute hypercapnic failure has a high level of evidence in all of the following except COPD exacerbation, acute cardiogenic failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, Weaning and post extubation failure in COPD. So you can take your time since all, all of you who have tuned in live, I think, should answer these questions so that uh, you have uh, 
you don't have to go back to the module but those who haven't attended the module completely can go back and there are a lot of questions for people who want to who joined in late who want to attend this module so we won't be giving out answers as rajesh said so that it keeps the suspense on now so it will be available on the website so even those who are yeah. not tuned in now and they want to do it afterwards so it will be available for a certain period of time that will tell and within that period if they go and go all these such webinars they see and the answer that's also okay we can go to question number 3 now uh and question number 3 is late failure in niv in acute hypercapnic failure is defined as failure during weaning phase of niv and requiring intubation failure after 12 to 24 hours of niv and requiring intubation failure after 4 to 6 hours of niv requiring intubation or all of the above are actually defined as late failure what is late failure and i think after the excellent talks we had we don't need a minute for these answers we need 30 seconds if you ask me i think anyone who is listening would need less than 30 seconds to answer these right niv next question niv escalation to invasive mechanical ventilation should be performed when persisting ph below 7.1 or deterioration in ph despite niv imminent respiratory arrest or severe respiratory distress glasgow coma scale less than 8 or all of the above are indications to move niv to invasive mechanical ventilation okay so remember a was persisting ph below 7.1 or just deterioration ph despite niv so i think it's something you may want to think about before you answer and we'll go to the final question which is which of the following statements is false regarding ohs with hypercapnic respiratory failure NIV is indicated when pH is below 7.35 pCO2 less than 6.5 kilopascals and respiratory rate more than 23 NIV is indicated when daytime pCO2 less than 6.5 kilopascals with daytime somnolence longer treatment time on NIV is required to normalize pCO2 in OHS and d in patients with ohs the criteria of niv initiation in hypercapnic acute respiratory failure is different from acute exacerbation of copd so which of the below statements is false okay so thank you everyone for attending and thank you uh, rajesh and uh, raja as always from the indian chess society to bring this uh, uh, webinar course and there are uh, uh, two more uh, sessions i think rajesh two more uh, modules on this course yeah so there are there three are, more in fact was second three more so yeah. we got I know I am moderating one of them and uh, we are looking forward to that and for those of you who need to log in I think on the Indian Chess Society website you will have the links uh, where you can log in and revise these two this excellent talk and this excellent case presentation and the good uh, panel discussion we had thank you very much for attending and sorry we are ending it 5 minutes late thank you thank you Raj thank, thank you thank you Bye, thank you for moderating thank, thank you. you thank you very much thank you thank